All right, we're gonna be looking at chapter 10 now with the muscular tissue. So a quick overview when we talk about muscular tissue, the motion is gonna result from muscles contracting and then relaxing. Myology is the study of muscles, and there are three types of muscular tissue which we discussed back in chapter four. So when we look at these three tissues, they're smooth, skeletal, and cardiac. And when we look at picture A, this is gonna be skeletal muscle. B is cardiac, and C is smooth. So let's take a little closer look at comparing these three. So if we look at an overview of skeletal muscle, it is an elongated, multinucleated, striated cell. It's gonna be unbranched. It's gonna to attach to bones via ligaments. This is why they're your skeletal muscles which make your bones move. They're very large in their diameter and length. They do have sarcomeres and this is what gives them that striated structure. Their contraction speed is fast. They're controlled voluntarily by your somatic nervous system, but regeneration in your skeletal muscles is very limited. On the other hand, for cardiac muscles, those cells are also elongated, but they're uninucleated with one nucleus. They are also striated because they have sarcomeres. They're branched. They have intercalated discs, and these discs have gap junctions so that these cells can communicate and contract all together in unison. This is gonna be found in your heart, their diameter and length is still pretty large. They have a moderate contraction speed. Their control is involuntary by the autonomic nervous system. And again, their regeneration is limited. Now for smooth muscle, we'll see that they are tapered, they're uninucleated, and they're not striated at all. The walls of your hollow organs are going to be made up of smooth muscle, as well as the erector pili in your skin. Their diameter and length is small. Again, they do not have any sarcomeres. Their contraction speed is slow, and they are also controlled involuntarily by your autonomic nervous system. Now, these do have a considerable amount or ability to regenerate compared to skeletal or cardiac muscles, but it's still very limited if you compare it to other tissues like epithelial tissue. So what's the function here of like the muscular system? Well, it's to produce body movements like running and walking. This is gonna be your skeletal muscles. We also see that it's gonna help stabilize your body positions like sitting and standing. Again, skeletal muscles are going to help with this. It can, they can store and move substances throughout your body. So we have some examples here like sphincters. They open and close, and so it's, it's gonna be muscle cells that either open or close a, an area where we can actually move the contents from one area to the next, like from your stomach into your intestines or um, from your urinary bladder out, and this is gonna be smooth muscle. We also see that your heart, heart is gonna pump blood, moves food through your GI tract, and it aids in returning blood to your heart. And this is all gonna be a combination of cardiac, smooth, and skeletal muscle. We also see that it produces heat. This is called thermogenesis. The whole point of shivering is to cause your skeletal muscles to generate heat and warm your body. Now, characteristics of muscle tissue is they are excitable. Example of excitable tissues or cells are muscle and nerve cells. They respond to stimuli and they create action potentials, electrical impulses. We see that they also are contractible. They usually shorten in length when they're stimulated, so they contract okay, in that process. We also see that they can be stretched, so they're ex extensible. They are gonna have some elastic to them, so, they, so they're gonna to return to their normal shape after they contract. All right, so let's look at the gross anatomy of a skeletal muscle. Now remember, gross here is going to talk about large scale anatomy. All right, so we're gonna look at the levels of organi organization, and we're gonna start first with the chemical level because that's what we start with when we're working our way up. Then we're gonna look at the cells, the tissues, and then the organ itself. So when we look at the chemicals that are part of the skeletal muscle, these are what we call myofibrils. These are made of protein myofilaments known as actin and myosin, and they are gonna form the sarcomere structure that we see in skeletal muscles. The cells of a skeletal muscle are known as muscle fibers. The muscle fibers get bunched together with connective tissue around them, and these are called muscle fascicles. And then of course, the whole thing with all the fascicles packaged together create the muscle itself. All right, so we see here you have your muscle fiber, which is the cell. A bundle of these cells is a fascicle, and then many of these fascicles together make the whole muscle. Now, when we look at the muscle as a whole, as its organ, there's gonna be some connective tissue in here with that muscle tissue. 
we see that there are going to be tendons present. Tendons, again, are dense, regular connective tissue. They attach muscle to bone. Okay, and when we look here, they're going to be extensions of the epi and peri and endomyosin. All right, and so we do see that there's going to be extension connecting the muscle to the bone. We then see there's what we call the deep fascia connective tissue. This is the outer muscle covering. All right, so you can see that here. It's the outer muscle covering. When we move in, we have what we call the epimyosin. The epimyosin is connective tissue that's a sheet um, that directly surrounds the entire muscle. So it's going to hold the muscle together. So we have the deep fascia, and just inside of that, you have the epimyosin. We then have the paramyosin. The paramyosin is going to surround a bundle of muscle fibers that we call the fascicles. So they cover the fascicles. And then you have the endomyosin, which is also going to cover individual muscle fibers. The whole point here is to insulate so that they can conduct their action potentials so that the fibers can contract. Now, if we look at this, it's almost like wrapping a present multiple times. Okay, so we have the muscle fiber itself, and it's going to be wrapped in a, a layer of endomyosin. Then we're going to take a group of muscle fibers that have been individually wrapped, and we're going to wrap them again with the paramyosin. Then we're going to take a group of those fascicles that have been wrapped in paramyosin and we're going to wrap them with the epimyosin. And then we're going to wrap it again with the deep fascia. So you can notice that it's got multiple layers wrapped around these muscle cells. So guys, when we look here, the nerves are going to stimulate your muscles to contract and they're going to do this through electrical impulses or what we call action poten potentials. Action potentials are carried by somatic motor nerves when we're talking about the skeletal muscles. So we see that there's going to be some sort of stimulus that's going to come down through the nerve and it's going to cause some sort of response by the muscle and that's going to be a type of contraction. Now these effector skeletal muscles are controlled by the somatic nervous system so this is a voluntary type of movement. Now if the effector is smoother cardiac muscle or if it's talking to glands this is going to be the autonomic nervous system so it's involuntary. The sensory neur neurons are going to send an input. This is going to cause an afferent pathway up towards your spinal cord and your brain. This leads to the central nervous system, which is your control center. Your central nervous system is going to decide what needs to be done. It will then send a signal down the efferent pathway, down the motor neurons. This is the output. The output is going to tell the skeletal muscles what to do. So in this case, it's showing you an example. You have a stimulus. Okay, there's some sort of sharp object that is coming into contact with the skin. And so the stimulus is sent through the sensory neuron to the central nervous system. It's going to determine what needs to be done, and it sends a motor neuron output. This then tells the skeletal muscle to move. So if you were touching that particular um, sharp object, it was going to allow you to then pull your hand, your arm back by contracting the bicep. Now your muscles have a good blood supply. They contain abundant capillaries and this is important because they need to supply tons of nutrients and oxygen to these cells. These cells are going to need to be able to produce high levels of ATP and we'll see why in a minute because contraction requires high levels of ATP or energy. We also need these blood vessels to remove any of the waste products that are going to be made through cellular respiration. All right, so now let's look at the microscopic anatomy of the skeletal muscle. Okay, so we went big picture. How does the muscle look as a whole? Now we're going to get down into the actual, actual muscle fiber and what we also call the sarcomere. So the muscle fiber or the cell is multinucleated. It's elongated. It's a long cell that's cylindrical. And it's going to run in parallel arrangements. So they're going to run in the same direction. These are set, you have a set number before birth, and these will typically last your whole life unless, of course, some sort of damage happens to them. These are made up of what we call myofibrils. We see that there's a special type of plasma membrane that's covering these myofibrils. It is called the, called the sarcolemma. The reason this is special is they contain these transverse or T-tubules that are going to um, go in between the different cells. Okay, This allows for a quicker response to take place since these cells are so long. You can find them here. These are part of the plasma membrane. These transverse tubules are associated with that sarcolemma. 
We also see that it has a special type of cytoplasm called sarcoplasm. This is going to contain many mitochondria to help produce, produce ATB, ATP. We also see that there's going to be an area for glycogen to be stored. This is a stored type of glucose. We also see myoglobulin, which is going to bind to the oxygen and hold on to it until it's needed. And we also see that they have sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, sarcoplasmic reticulum is a specialized type of smooth ER. This is going to store and release calcium ions, which are going to be important for the sarcomeres contractions. So you can see here the sarcoplasm, which is the cytoplasm. Lots of mitochondria are present because of the high demand of ATP through cellular respiration. And the sarcoplasmic reticulum is a modified form of the smooth ER containing those calcium ions. Now, if you'll notice, sarco is in each of these. So when you say sarco as a part of the actual name, it is going to pertain to a muscle cell. We also see that the terminal cisterns are all going to be part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And they run next to those transverse tubules, which are part of the sarcolemma or plasma membrane. All right, so when we look at myofibril, these are made of protein myofilaments that we call actin and myosin, and these are gonna be thin and thick filaments. The thin filaments are known as the actin, okay? So we see that the myofibril, when we take it out of there, we have the thin filaments, which are the actin. These have binding sites for the myosin heads, but they are covered in this picture by troponin and tropomyosin we see that there are going to be seen as thin in the sarcomere. In this picture, you can see the thinner line is the actin. The thicker line is the myosin. These are the thick filaments, and they have these special heads on them. They kind of look like a double golf club. These are going to be the myosin heads that are gonna to connect to the binding sites on actin. And in the picture, you can see that they are a thicker line in the sarcomere. So a myofilament is going to be actin and myosin, and they are located in compartments that we call the sarcomere. A sarcomere is the, contract the contractile units that contain thin and thick filaments, and you can see that here. This is called a sarcomere. So let's look at the structural arrangement of these myofilaments, the actin and myosin. So we see that there's going to be these Z-discs that are going to separate the sarcomeres. Okay, so the zigzag type line that you see is the Z-discs. They're going to separate one sarcomere from the next. We then see that there's an area called the I-band. The I-band is the light band, which means that there are the thin filaments only. Okay, so this is going to be this section because it's a thin filaments only only that are present. So the I band is the thin. We then have the A band. The A band is the dark band, and this is going to be the thick filaments. Okay, and so if you'll notice, there are some overlap with some thin filaments here, but anywhere there are thick filaments, they're gonna be part of the I band. The H zone is the area where only thick filaments are found. And then the very middle part of the sarcomere is known as the M line. This is the middle of the H zone and it holds the thick filaments together. All right, guys, you need to understand these different structures of the sarcomere. So you need to be able to identify if a sarcomere picture is present, where's the Z disc, the I band, the A band, the H zone, and the M line. So now let's talk about the contraction and relaxation of these muscle fibers. How does that sarcomere actually work? Well, the sarcomere is going to work using what we call a sliding filament model. This explains how the muscle fibers will contract and relax. So in the sarcomere, you'll notice that the thin filaments and the thick filaments had some overlap. What's going to happen is these are going to actually move over each other and overlap more when the muscle is contracted, shortening the muscle as a whole. But guys, if you'll notice, my arms didn't get shorter, just the space between them did. Okay, then it's going to relax and come back. Okay, so we see that the contraction is going to happen and relaxing, so they're sliding over each other, and this is where this model comes from. So let's talk about each step. So during relaxation, the calcium is stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The myosin heads are detached from the actin. So at rest, they're just sitting there. Nothing is attached, and the calcium is put away in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. But when contraction needs to take place, calcium is going to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's going to cause the sticky heads of the myosin to attach to the actin forming cross bridges. So those little golf club type heads are gonna be able to attach to those binding sites and they're going to actually pull. 
okay? This cross bridging is going to be hydrolyzed by ATP. So the myosin head has an ATP ace that's going to utilize the ATP. And this process of binding and pooling is called a power stroke. This is where the myosin pools on the actin fibers to shorten the sarcomere. So during contraction, sarcomeres do shorten, but the length of the thick and thin filaments do not change. Z discs move towards the M line. So here are a couple of questions to think about. What happens to the width between the Z discs? Okay, so if we're looking here, the Z discs, what's gonna happen to them? Well, they are going to get narrower. They're gonna get closer together because they're being pulled towards that M line. What happens to the width of the H zone? It's also going to get narrower because the H zone, recall, is the area with only thick filaments. As the thin filaments slide over, there's no, the H zone's gonna get smaller. What happens to the width of the I band? It again gets narrower because that is the area that has only the thin filaments. See, they're sliding over, so there's not gonna be as much of that. But then the last question says, what happens to the width of the I band? Or sorry, what happens to the width of the A band? Well, there's no change in that. The A band is the length of the thick filaments. There was already an overlap of the thin filaments on it, so nothing really changes in that particular um, side because that band is going to be a combination of thick and thin filaments anyways. So if you look at this picture over here, you see a muscle where it's relaxed, it's partially contracted and it's moving in, and then it's completely contracted. You can see how the H zone is going to be smaller as or more narrow as well as the I bands. So let's look at components of a motor unit. How does the nervous system talk to these muscle fibers? Well, we're gonna use a somatic motor neuron. This is gonna generate an action potential to stimulate the skeletal muscles or fibers to contract. It's going to use a axon terminal. This is the end of the axon that branches and it comes into close proximity to the muscle fiber, which you can see here. This is the axon terminal. Terminal means the end. We then have a motor end plate. This motor end plate is an area of the sarcolemma or the muscle fiber where the axon terminal is the closest. It still is a space. They're not actually physically touching. Okay, so this is called the motor end plate. This is going to be where the neurotransmitter receptors are going to be located. Okay, and you can see a picture of it here with the axon terminal with the motor end plate on the muscle. The gap that's between the axon and the sarcolemma or that motor end plate is known as the synaptic cleft. This cleft is going to be where the neurotransmitters are going to then go to the receptors on the motor end plate. The area that releases the neurotransmitters, in the example of this is acetylcholine, this is going to be what we call the synaptic bulbs. So they are gonna be the ones who actually release the neurotransmitter, the signal to the muscle. The neuromuscular junction is the synapsis between the motor neuron and the motor end plate of the muscle. So when we talk about that synaptic cleft, that area is also known as the neuromuscular junction. Now collectively, a single motor neuro neuro neuron in all the muscle fibers it stimulates is called a motor unit. So the whole thing as a whole is known as a motor unit. So again, you can see in the picture, you have the synaptic cleft, you have the synaptic end bulb, and then the area where the synaptic cleft is located is known as the neuromuscular junction. The whole motor neuron contains the neuron talking to the different skeletal muscle fibers. All right, so let's look at this contraction and how, again, this whole thing works, looking at it with the actual neuron as well. So for a contraction to take place, a nerve impulse has to send an action potential, and it has to reach the axon terminal, which you can see up here in the number one. The neurotransmitter acetylcholine is gonna be released into the neuromuscular junction, into that synaptic cleft. It's gonna then diffuse across the cleft, and it's going to connect or bind to the receptors for acetylcholine on the sarcolemma, the plasma membrane of the muscle cell. When this happens, it's gonna trigger the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This is going to cause the calcium to go into the sarcoplasm and it's gonna help start the contraction process. 
The myosin heads will then attach to the actin filaments and pull on the actin filaments, causing them to slide inward with that power stroke. Now, guys, they can't do this unless calcium binds and releases the binding sites on the actin. Okay, so this is why the calcium is so important. It's got to bind to that troponin and tropomyosin so that the binding sites can be present so that those heads can connect and pull and do their power stroke. This causes the sarcomere to sh shorten, okay? It causes that sliding to take place. Now, this means that a contraction is going to require a number of things. For one, it's going to require this ATP and this calcium. But this calcium and ATP is not even going to come in contact with those fibers unless it gets the message from the nerve through acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that starts this whole process, but calcium and ATP must also be present in order for a contraction to take place. Now for relaxation, we need to see that the acetylcholine needs to go away. So there's an enzyme called the acetylcholinerase uh, that's going to inactivate the acetylcholine. It's going to break it apart. This is going to make the calcium be transferred back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. All right, so it's going to suck it back up. This is going to cause the actin filaments to slip back into their relaxed position because that troponin and tropomyosin cover the binding sites and the myosin heads can't attach. So they're going to slide back into their original position and relax in that process. Now, relaxation, guys, is still going to require a couple of things. It's going to require the enzyme that's going to break down acetylcholine, and it also requires ATP. So, guys, energy is required to contract the muscle, but energy is also required to relax the muscle. We need the energy on both sides. All right, so in your PowerPoint here, you can, clip on, you can click on this little clip, and you can watch this little video that explains the muscle contraction with an animation. All right, so rigor mortis, guys, is what happens after death. Um, we see that at death, the calcium starts to leak out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This allows the myosin heads to attach to the actin filaments as long as ATP is present. When no more ATP is being produced, the muscle is going to not be able to relax because remember, ATP is required to contract it, but also to relax it. So this is why the muscles go stiff and it lasts for about 24 hours until the actual muscle tissue starts to break down. It starts to disintegrate. Okay, and so when we look at this, we see that the contractions stay, and this is why they can go in, and if, if the individual is in rigor, we know that they have been dead less than 24 hours because those muscle tissues haven't started to break down. All right, so let's talk about muscle metabolism. Okay, so muscles are gonna require a huge amount of chemical reactions to take place, specifically in the formation of ATP. So the generation of ATP in the muscle is going to use what we call a creatine phosphate. This creatine phosphate is a charged up molecule that has a lot of stored energy. It's only associated with our muscles and this creatine phosphate and ATP store enough in chemical energy to last for about 15 seconds. Now, excess ATP is used to generate the CP. This is done through kinase transfers of phosphate groups. Now remember, kinase is an enzyme, and you know this because it ends in ACE. So what happens here is ATP is gonna be broken down into ATP and phosphate. A kinase is gonna transfer that phosphate to the creatine, and this is what's gonna create the creatine phosphate, or the CP. This is going to allow it to hold on to the phosphate molecule so it does not get lost and it can be transferred back to ADP to generate more ATP when needed. So this is a reversible reaction. So creatine kinase or CPK or CK is an enzyme associated with heart, skeletal muscles, and the brain. Elevated blood levels of CPK indicate that one of these organs have been damaged. So it should not be in your blood, but if it's showing up in your blood work, then one of these has been damaged, the heart, skeletal muscles, or brain. So generation of ATP molecules are going to go through the process of aerobic respiration. And of course, it starts with glycolysis. Now glycolysis, guys, remember, is an anaerobic process because oxygen is not required. This is going to generate two ATP for each molecule of glucose that the muscle fiber takes in. This allows for quick bursts of energy, but it's only for a very short time because of the fact that it only makes two ATP. 
Glycogen is a complex carbohydrate, which is our intermediate energy storage molecule that we do in muscles. So when the muscles have the ability to store up some extra glucose, they are going to store it in the form of glycogen. Now, if no oxygen is present, lactic acid is generated through this process of glycolysis because the pyruvic acid that's created at the end of glycolysis does not have the ability to go into the mitochondria if oxygen is absent. So this process still continues, but a waste product of lactic acid starts to build up. This lactic acid is toxic to our muscles, and this is what makes our muscles sore. So if your muscles are sore after a workout, that's telling you that you did not give your muscles enough oxygen. We need to work on our breathing through those exercises. We need our muscles to go into the or from the anaerobic stage to the aerobic stage of cellular respiration. This is going to generate a lot more ATP from that glucose molecule. It's going to generate about 36 ATP. This does include the process of glycolysis because the pyruvic acid that's made in the glycolysis reaction is going to be used for the rest of this aerobic respiration. Oxygen is required to complete this breakdown of glucose into CO2 and water. Remember that this does occur in the mitochondria, the specialized organelle that we call the powerhouse. So glycogen in our muscles is going to get broken back down into glucose. This glucose is going to go through the process of glycolysis, which occurs in the sarcoplasm. This is going to create pyruvate. Pyruvate then needs to go into the mitochondria, but in order to gain access, it must have oxygen. Oxygen's like its ticket to get into the mitochondria. So oxygen has to be present. If oxygen is present, then we can see another set of 36 ATP can be made. And this is going to then create the byproducts of CO2 and H2O and not the lactic acid we saw before. In the anaerobic side, no O2 is available, so there's only two ATP that is formed, and lactic acid starts to build up. This causes your muscles to fatigue and be sore. Your liver has the ability to take that lactic acid and return it or convert it back to pyruvate so your cells can use it, but it has to get into the bloodstream. This is one reason why we talk about how if you're sore, you need to go ahead and work out your muscles because that working out process is going to push that lactic acid into your bloodstream, which then can take it to the liver and not just sit in your muscle tissue, making you even sore the next day if, if that does occur. So this was going to be what we would look at as oxygen recovery. Now guys, in general, oxygen depletion occurs when oxygen is not being supplied fast enough to your muscles during especially strenuous exercise. A type of anaerobic respiration does occur and lactic acid builds up. But during recovery, elevated oxygen uptake does occur and oxygen is used to convert some of the lactic acid back to pyruvate to go through the aerobic cellular respiration cycle in the mitochondria this allows for the generation the ge allows to allows the mitochondria to generate more atps now causes of muscle fatigue which is the inability to maintain strength of a contraction is going to be due to lowered calcium levels in the sarcoplasm okay so the muscles could be fatigued because they have low levels of calcium we also see there could be depletion of that creatine phosphate the glycogen or even atp Insufficient oxygen can also cause the muscle to fatigue. A buildup of lactic acid, which decreases the pH in your muscles, which makes them not be able to work as efficiently. Decreased acetylcholine being released from your nerves, because remember this whole process starts with the nerves sending the signal through the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. If that's not being released properly, the muscles are gonna start to get fatigued or weaker. So let's talk about the control of muscle tension. We see that the same size action potential or nerve impulse is used each time to stimulate the muscle fiber. So guys, if you look at the bottom of the chart in blue, you see that the motor neuron is sending the same signal. It's, there's no difference or deviation from it. Okay, it's the same height. The only thing that's different is how fast it's coming, okay, or how many times it sends the signal. The amount of muscle contraction or force of the muscle contraction does vary. Because so if you look here in the first one, there's a certain amount of force, but then the next one it kind of is moving up and so on. Okay, so the muscle contraction force can change. The force of contraction depends on the frequency of the muscle fiber stimulation. Okay, so this is the rate of the nerve impulses, not the actual height of it. Okay, so we see that the height 
okay, is going to be the same, but how quickly it's being sent changes how the muscle is going to have its contraction. So guys, a brief contraction of all muscle fibers in a motor unit due to a single action potential is known as a single twitch, which we see here at the beginning of the chart. We had one signal, one action potential, and we had one single twitch. However, we do see that when, st when a stimuli is arriving at different times causing longer contractions, this is called a wave summation. So when we look here, it goes into waves and we're adding, it's getting bigger in the process. A sustained contraction, however it's still wavering in the process, is known as an unfused tetanus, okay, because it's still building, but it's not going to be a constant. It's wavering. But a sustained contraction is going to be a fused tetanus, which you see here at the end. And if you'll notice, the frequency of the signals from the nerves are very close together. They're sending it over and over and over again, causing that summation to take place, but it's fused. It's a constant incline for that contraction. So guys, all muscle fibers of a motor unit will contract and relax together. So the total tension produced by your, during your muscle contractions depends on those number of fibers. So one motor neuron can contract multiple muscle fibers and on average it's about 150 muscle fibers. But in the eye, we see that one motor neuron only stimulates 10 fibers, so it's a quicker movement that can take place. But in the leg, for those larger gross movements, like for your quad, one motor neuron is going to stimulate 2,000 muscle fibers. Okay, so it's a lot more that they have to get wrangled and working together versus the eye that only has to worry about 10. Right, so the difference there is how quick they can get them organized and get them moving. And it's still relatively fast, but the eye movement's gonna be a lot quicker than the leg movements. All right, so let's look at what a twitch contraction is composed of. We see first that there's this latent period. This is between the stimulus or when the action potential was sent and the actual start of the contraction, right? Because we had to send the signal and we have to start letting those calcium ions rush out in order for it to start to contract. This is known as the latent period. So calcium is being released into the sarcoplasm from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The myosin heads are going to start the process of attaching to the actin filaments. They're getting ready. They haven't done their power stroke yet, but they're getting ready. The contraction period is when the shortening of the sarcomeres does occur. This is when the power strokes of the myosin heads is going to happen. So calcium allows the myosin heads to attach to the actin because they, they are going to combine to that tropin and tropomyosin. This results in the power stroke of the myosin head shorting the sarcomere. But remember, this does require ATP. The relaxation period is going to be where the calcium is being pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This is when the myosin heads are going to detach and the lengthening of the sarcomere takes place. Remember, the detachment of the myosin heads also requires the use of ATP. Now, there is a relative refractory period that takes place. This is the time the muscle and the nerve cells can actually not respond to the next stimuli. This is a temporary loss of excitability, and the muscle responds to the first stimulus, but not the second. Refractory periods are going to vary but depending on the type of muscle, okay, based on which type of muscle we're looking at. Now, there's three types of muscle contractions. There's isometric, concentric, and eccentric. There's a video here that talks about the, difference, the differences here. Um, but you need to watch the video and look at how we, why we do certain workouts. Why some workouts are going to be where you have to sustain the movement, you're holding it in place, okay, keeping that muscle engaged, or are you going to be using the muscle back and forth in a movement? All right, this is just to give you an idea.